Please don't give up. That's not what scientists want when they write these reports. They write them so the public understands the severity and urgency of this crisis. So let's continue to listen to scientists and fight for climate action and justice. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm Shannon Osaka, the climate zeitgeist reporter for the Washington Post. And today we continue our week long This is Climate series with Elena Wood. Elena is a scientist and a TikTok star, and she joins us today to talk about science communication and climate doomism. Elena, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Me too. And unfortunately, Bill Nye had to cancel his appearance and will not be joining us. But Elena, I'm really looking forward to talking to you. And so let's jump right in. So on social media, you're known as the Garbage Queen, which to my understanding is based on an earlier nickname of the Trash Queen. Can you talk a little bit about your history, your background, and how you came to this moniker? Absolutely. So I am a sustainability scientist and my work offline for years primarily has revolved around managing water and soil quality at landfills and other solid waste operations. So when I decided to join TikTok, I was trying to come up with a nickname that people would remember me by. Unfortunately, the trash queen was a taken username on TikTok, but the garbage queen wasn't. And that's how I became the garbage queen. That's awesome. And it's very catchy and I think very memorable as well. So obviously climate change, we hear all of this negative news all the time. People are inundated with it. Can you define for our audience what climate doomism is and why it can be dangerous? Absolutely. So climate doom is a form of climate misinformation that insinuates it is either too late or quickly becoming too late to address climate change. Obviously, the science does not agree to, with that whole statement, but climate doom tends to pop up when we have a lot of almost clickbaity headlines that insinuates it's too late. I was going to ask you about those headlines because some of your videos you go through and you debunk some of the really doomist headlines or tweets or things like that. What is the responsibility of journalists and of climate communicators to avoid these kinds of really doomist framings? So I think it's really important for journalists, scientists, and climate communicators alike to make sure that we are not discouraging people from taking action against the climate crisis. So when we spread climate doom, whether it's inadvertently or on purpose, we almost play into this idea that it is too late. So again, it's very important that we are careful with the words we choose to describe climate change because the public will take it and they will run with it. You've said before that fear and virality go hand in hand. Can you talk about how that might make it difficult to foreground solutions and good climate news when you're producing content? It's absolutely tough. Fear always seems to go viral, especially on TikTok. That just seems to be human nature. So it can be difficult to get ahead of that misinformation or ahead of that fear. But I've noticed that if you talk a little bit about the fear, the scariness, the doom, and then end it with either a call to action or a discussion of solutions, that tends to go more viral than just simply talking about the solution. Interesting. So you have to give that sort of individual action component. And I think I've heard that from climate psychologists as well. I want to ask you about TikTok. I mean, what drew you to TikTok as a platform specifically? Was it just this is where the young people are or was there something unique about the format that you felt you could really use? So to be completely honest, I downloaded TikTok at the beginning of the pandemic because I was bored. 
I had no intention of becoming a climate communicator, but I quickly realized people wanted to hear that information. And well, I was good at giving that information. And I'm sure my friends and family are very appreciative that I am doing this online instead of constantly talking to them about climate change. But what I really enjoy about TikTok now that I've been on the platform is that yes, it is primarily young people, but all the people who are on TikTok, whether they be young or old, are asking such detailed questions. And it's really making me and other climate communicators think. I'm curious, I mean, what goes into you making a video? I mean, where do you start with the idea? How do you vet your information and make sure you're giving the most scientific and up-to-date facts? How does that process work? So it works in a few different ways. Sometimes I'll have my audience reach out to me either in a comment, an email, or a direct message and ask me, hey, can you talk about this certain topic? Sometimes I get tagged in videos that are full of misinformation. And I also will just read the news and talk to my colleagues in climate communication and activism to see what topics, what policies, what solutions are coming down the line that I should talk about. Once I choose a topic, I do a bunch of research, I talk to colleagues, I start writing a script, and then once I'm comfortable with it, I film it, edit, post it, and see what the reaction is. Are there particular topics that you found really resonate with people, really strike your viewers more than others? Absolutely. I've noticed that any time I talk about misinformation in general seems to go well. Whenever I debunk climate doom, people tend to like that because they don't want things to be too late. They want to have hope. Another thing that I've noticed people like to talk about is imperfect environmentalism and imperfect sustainability which is basically making the whole idea of individual climate action more attainable for people because they don't feel the need to be completely vegan or completely car free. They understand now that doing whatever they can within their means is perfect. I wanted to ask you about this because it's a challenge that I face as a climate journalist as well, because I know that people want to know what they can do individually. At the same time, we also know that climate change is obviously this huge systemic problem and individual actions alone won't get us there. I mean, how do you think about that balance in terms of your coverage between systemic challenges and individual action? It's certainly a difficult balance to find because a lot of the best individual climate action items we can take is within our own community. And when you have a global audience like I do, it can be difficult to say, hey, you should go to your local government council meetings and advocate for X, Y, and Z because every community is different. But my advice to anyone watching is to balance trying to do sustainable things in your life, like reducing how much plastic waste you produce or how much meat and dairy products you eat. Do that in whatever way is affordable and attainable for you. And then also fight for climate action at a local, state, and federal level through voting and through asking your elected officials to pass climate policies. Yeah, I think that that makes a lot of sense, balancing sort of that political action with the individual action in your own life. You mentioned earlier when you were talking about your friends and family are probably happy that you're doing this on TikTok and not bothering them. And that's one thing I wanted to talk about as well, which is just that, you know, recent polls from the Yale Center on Climate Communication show that about two thirds of Americans are somewhat or very worried about climate change. At the same time, about two thirds of Americans say that they actually don't talk about climate change almost at all. So why do you think people are finding it so difficult to talk about this issue with their friends and family and what can be done about that? Unfortunately, I think climate change is still a taboo topic. I live in an area where it certainly is. And I think a lot of people are afraid to say that they want climate action. They believe in climate change. They know it's real. But my advice to any of them is make it a dinner table conversation. You don't outright have to say the words climate change, but mention, oh, hey, it's a lot warmer than it normally would be in December. Or did you see that natural disaster? That's odd that that happened. Start the conversation there and then work climate change into it. I think all of my family, whether they want climate action or not, can agree that things are not quite normal. Yeah, absolutely. I think everyone has that sense increasingly that the climate has changed. Some people are maybe a little bit behind in thinking about what the causes of that are, but we can all recognize that. 
Um, I want to ask you about how climate communication has changed because, you know, I think maybe 10, 15 years ago, it was all about, okay, we need to communicate to people that climate change is real. Now I think we've moved past that to a large extent. I mean, what do you think are the frontiers in terms of what we need to be communicating and how we should do that? So I believe the main focus of climate communication at this point should be on solutions and progress. And ideally ways that individuals can make that solutions and make those progress happen. So obviously there are still people who do not understand the severity of the climate crisis. And there will always need to be climate communications geared towards them. But the more and more the climate crisis goes on, the more people are aware that it exists and want to do something about it. So instead of it being solely issues-based communication, we should be focusing more on solutions-based communication, but not in a way that insinuates it is a-okay and everything is good. There still needs to be a balance between recognizing the issue of the climate crisis and recognizing that we have the solutions to address it. What are some of the strategies that you explain to people the importance of solutions and kind of, I mean, the solution space is so huge. There's all of these different sectors where carbon emissions come from. It's hard for people to understand all of the technological advances. I mean, how do you break that down for people? So it's something I struggle with myself. There are so many solutions in every single sector and I'm just one person who specializes in waste. So what I try to do is take an issue that's relevant, whether it's in the news or someone asks me about it, and then talk about solutions related to that issue. And then try to open the door to get people to do their own research because Again, I'm just one person. There are only so many climate communicators in the world and there are a plethora of solutions out there. But I think at the end of the day, tying in the issues to the solutions is the way to go. When we're thinking about communication, I mean, obviously climate change is still unfortunately a very polarized issue and a very partisan issue, particularly here in the United States. I mean, do you think solutions journalism is a way forward in terms of breaking down some of that polarization? Or how do you think about kind of the uh, the partisan audiences for your work? So I think solutions-based journalism is a great way to lessen that divide between people who are all on board with climate action and those who may not be. Because when people can see the good in the climate solutions, they're going to be more likely to support them because a lot of these climate solutions are going to help solve not just climate issues, but social issues and financial issues. So when people understand that everything is connected and intersectional, I believe they're going to be more likely to push for climate action. Yeah, absolutely. Um, When we're thinking about climate anxiety, I mean, obviously there's a lot of young people increasingly who are saying, I'm really anxious about climate change. People who are worried about this sort of 10 year timeline who think, you know, maybe the world is gonna end in 2030. Are we even gonna have a future after that point? I mean, how do you think about that in terms of communicating to young people and explaining that there is still hope, but also that climate anxiety is a real thing that people are struggling with? Absolutely. So I myself have climate anxiety and I did not realize that was a thing until I got into climate communication. Obviously, the studies have shown that young people in particular are experiencing climate anxiety at much higher rates than older generations. And it's really difficult to have that balance between recognizing, yes, this is an issue. It's a very valid response to the climate crisis and encouraging people to take action, because when we give these deadlines of sorts, 2030, 2040, 2050, people almost make up their own minds about those deadlines and say that it's going to be too late afterwards. So I'm a little hesitant to give big year deadlines for that reason, because I don't want to worsen anyone's climate anxiety. But at the same time, we need to recognize that this is a crisis and the quicker we act, the better things will be. But if we don't act enough, it's not going to be the apocalypse like so many people think it will be in 2025 or 2030. Do you think that, you know, journalists and communicators have 
push too hard maybe on the deadline side of things in terms of saying, you know, we have until 2030, we have until 2025. I mean, do you think mistakes have been made in that form of communication or has it been worth it to sort of advance urgency? Honestly, I think it's a little bit of both. There are people who really need to hear that deadline to take action. And then there are people who have been in this space, who have cared for years, or maybe they just started caring, but see that deadline as something very anxiety inducing. So I think there's still a need to say, hey, we need to try to hit 1.5, you know, keep under 1.5 by 2030, but then explain it further that if we don't hit that mark, it's not going to be the whole end of the world, although things will still be pretty bad. <laughs> Yeah, I think about that a lot, too, of trying to communicate, yes, every tenth of a degree matters. You know, if we miss 1.5, there's still 1.6, 1.7, 1.8, and so on. And I think that, you know, that can be hard to explain, but very important to explain. Um, we're almost out of time here, so I want to ask, what is the number one advice that you give people in terms of thinking about climate change in their lives or thinking about how to talk to others? What are a couple of the things that you want to tell our audience? So one of my main pieces of, of advice is to clean up your social media timelines. If you were noticing that you were feeling anxious and sad and angry all the time after you're scrolling social media, maybe you should change who you follow and maybe you should follow more solutions based journalists, creators, communicators, scientists, you name it. And also act local, think global. So try to work within your own community to get people to talk about climate change, get people to take climate action in their own lives. And then the more people that do that on the local level, the more likely change will happen on a global level. That's great advice That's great and advice. not something that I would have thought of in terms of advising, okay, you really need to clean up your inputs so that you can sort of feel better and know how to address action going forward. Um, I think we're out of time. Elena Wood, this was so interesting and so informative. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. And thanks to all of you for joining the conversation. To learn more about our upcoming live events, please check out WashingtonPostLive.com. Once again, I'm Shannon Osaka, and thanks so much for joining us today.